Uh, you've just stepped off stage for your panel. How did that go? Talk me through it in a few short words. The panel was great. We talked about the future of Palestine, which is a deeply depressing subject because Palestinians mm. have been waiting to have a decent future for a long time. It's important we always remember them at events like this and, and give an opportunity to have a discussion. Uh, I asked my you know, usual questions about uh, what's going to happen next, but also we had uh, Hanan Ashrawi and Saib Erekat uh, and uh, they've been around for a long time, so mm. I had to ask them, you know, when are you going to give way to younger leaders? That's a, a question that uh, could be broadly asked in, in many countries and yeah. states in where we are today, uh, in many kind of industries and areas, particularly yeah. in government. Yeah. Um, we're seeing a huge generational divide. That's not just in this area, that's obviously around the world. Yeah. Um, one of which is in the UK, where we've just seen an election won almost off the basis of, of, a, of a clean Brexit break. Yeah. What's your sentiments towards that, and particularly in the area of the press and how that was covered? I yeah. think the British press had a disaster. The British media, and well, let me rephrase it. The British press newspapers did not have a disaster. They got the result they wanted. They were in the can for the Conservative Party, for mm -hmm. Boris Johnson. The British press is very openly biased and right wing. And therefore, they went out with the single motivation of making sure that Labour and Jeremy Corbyn were defeated. And in that sense, they achieved their goal. The broadcasters, the TV, radio, the BBCs of this world, are obviously bound by legislation in the UK, which means they have to be impartial. They have to be neutral. They're not supposed to be pushing an agenda. I think the BBC had a nightmare of an election. They were heavily and rightly criticised for their coverage. Um, Boris Johnson was able to run rings around them. He wouldn't even give them an interview to their main interviewer, Andrew Neil, who's one of the toughest interviewers in British television. He mm -hmm. dodged an interview with him. Uh, it got to the point where the Prime Minister was hiding in a fridge from journalists. Uh, and, you know, what Boris Johnson has done in the UK is what Donald Trump has done in the US, is what Narendra Modi has done in India, which is we can run an election campaign and win while evading basic media scrutiny, which for those of us whose job it is to do the scrutiny, it's quite depressing to see yeah. that that actually works. Sure. So on that point then, how has this happened? Is this a juniorization of the newsroom? Is it the con you know, more control? Is it the, the stations who are taking the risk now? Uh, I think what's happened the is that a lot of quote unquote right wing populists is what they, you know, the, the phrase, you can use whatever language you want, nationalist populists, mm. have worked out that in a new media age, in a social media age, you know, we thought social media would be the great boon that democratized society, and it has in many ways, yeah. but it's also offered an ample opportunity to spread quote unquote fake news, to, um, uh, to sow disinformation. Steve Bannon, who was Trump's advisor, White House counsel, uh, uh, White House senior advisor, ran his election campaign. He had a line, he said, uh, he said to a journalist, he said, look, the Democrats are not our opposition. The media is our opposition. Yeah. And the way we deal with the media, he said, is to quote, flood the zone with shit. That was his phrase. And that's what they've done. So if you can put out so much nonsense that people at home are left saying, well, I don't know what the truth is. Yeah. I don't know what right wrong. Maybe they're both telling the truth. Maybe they're both lying. And the, and the broadcast media has had a real problem with that. In the US as well, where I'm based now, the CNNs of this world struggle with this because journalists are trained, especially a classically trained impartial journalist are, you must tell both sides of the story. You must not make yourself a player in the story. You must not call anyone a liar. You must just remain a detached, impartial observer. That doesn't work when one side is playing the system and is engaged in bad faith attacks yeah. on facts, on figures, on information, on demonstrable truths. Then the, the point of a journalist is to call that out. And a lot of journalists either aren't willing to do it, aren't allowed to do it, aren't able to do it, because it's, it's not in their wheelhouse. To say, you know, you see in the US now where people are saying, oh, well, the president lied. <gasps> I said lied. I'm not supposed to say a politician lied. I'm supposed to just lay out. The, but that's where we've reached now. And I think yeah. the same is happening in the UK, where the BBC was unable to cope with the Conservative Party's bad faith attacks. At one stage, the Conservative Party said to an election, maybe we'll cut the BBC's funding, which is an outrageous thing to say in the middle of an election campaign. Yeah. So on that then, I mean, the, the idea of you know, big decisions being made and governments pushing kind of mass movements and, and quite risky and dangerous agendas is, is not new. And these have gone untested and in many ways unscrutinized for many, many years. And we only have to allude back to the Iraqi invasion as an example. Yeah. So what has changed from then to now? Is it yeah. less? So here's my classic example. George W. Bush and Tony Blair, in my view, and I've said this in print, lied us into a, an illegal invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they exaggerated the evidence about WMDs. They, they cut corners. They selectively cherry-picked evidence, all of that stuff. But you know what George Bush, for all his many sins, didn't do? He did not stand up after the invasion of Iraq and go, what are you talking about? We found the WMDs. They're right there. 
course we found WMDs. That's what Donald Trump does. He literally says, up is down, black is white, hot is yep. cold, the sky is green. That level of barefaced um, uh, misinformation, of gaslighting, we haven't seen in our lifetimes before, not even from the George Bushes and Tony Blairs as well. And that, uh, that level of dishonesty, that, the attacks on the press, the use of fake news, I think it was Politico or one of these US media outlets did a study of how many foreign governments now have started using the language of fake news, enemies of the people, inspired by the president of the United States. I mean, why wouldn't you? If you're a world leader and you say, wait a minute, if the president of the US can get away with this stuff, why can't I do it as well? So it's made journalists and media organizations vulnerable to this attack globally. Mm -hmm. It's had global implications. I, as an interviewer, I do an interview show for Al Jazeera. I've been doing it for, for five, six, can't remember how many years now. But I can tell you in the last couple of years, I've noticed it with my guests that they're more likely now to say absurd falsehoods in a way they wouldn't have done a couple of years ago. Okay. They're more likely to say fake news whenever they want to get out of a yeah. corner. They're more likely to attack the press as their strategy for dealing with my questions. That's all quite new and quite dangerous. Absolutely, and so my question for that would be, because I mean, you've had, to, I, I, mean, I don't know if you've adopted it or, or changed it more over time, but you sometimes have to approach quite a hostile yeah. uh, approach to interviewing. Even if you do manage to call out those lies, yeah. um, you know, I referenced that, that great interview you had with one of Trump's advisors. With, with people, with lay people, it doesn't matter either yeah. way. No, it's a problem. It doesn't matter either way. It's a real problem. It's deeply demoralizing for those of us who do this for a living because you sometimes kind of think, you know, do I chuck it all in and go be an accountant? Not that there's anyone being an accountant. <laughs> but, you know, if your job is, you know, speak truth to power and, you know, give people the facts and educate people and uh, hold the powerful to account, and that's not happening because yeah. we live in an age where people don't trust the media or where there's so much misinformation and disinformation around that you can't work out the truth from falsehood uh, or where you have politicians engaging in bad faith attacks on the press, which they don't even believe. Yes, it is. You wonder, well, you know, what am I? Uh, is there any point to what I'm doing? I think the two things that keep me going is, number one, even if you can only persuade a few people in the margins, that matters. That's important because you're never going to convince the ideologues. You're never going to convince the partisans. They will just double down, yep. even in the face of the truth. But, you know, some people are. They're smaller and smaller number, a dwindling number of people are the kind of swing voters or the independents or the people on the fence. You need to get through to them. Uh, number two, the other reason I would say is, look, okay, fine. We might not be able to get, anyone, get through to anyone right now, but I do what I do because, you know, people say journalism is the first draft of history. I've got an eye on history. I want people to look back and say, you know what? Even in this period, this crazy 20, early 21st century period where everyone lost their minds and politicians just said mad stuff, there were some people who refused to take it lying down yeah. and carried on trying to say what was true, trying to say, you know what? They're not all the same. This isn't all nonsense. And you know what? Facts actually matter. Absolutely.